The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Tom Collins. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. Join Frank Race for the adventure of the embittered secretary. Fifth Avenue in a turtleneck sweater. The avenue was mellow under a mid-afternoon sun. And the sweater was mellowing my sales resistance as I thought of what it would do to a young lady of my acquaintance who happens to be the outdoor type and prefers it in men. I just about made up my mind to step into the shop and make the purchase when a reflection in the window sent my glance to the disapproving face of Mark Donovan. Oh, no. You ain't gonna buy that thing. What thing? That sweater. Well, I was thinking about it. You see, there's a girl I know that... It's yellow. There's nothing like color where this girl's concerned. She, It'll uh... make you look like a canary, and that ain't good. Even for a guy with your build. You don't think I should, huh? Uh, definitely not. Now, uh... <laughs> On a dame, uh, if that sweater was a little smaller... Yeah, we'll... I know. But for race, it's out. No. Oh, don't be so unhappy about it. Just stick to women that go in for pinstripe suits. It's simpler. What are you doing around here, anyway? Catching up with you. A call? Hmm? From Max Fain of the Coastal Life Insurance Company, and since I am parked double, and there might be a cop along any second... We must rush. Yeah. First, you spoil my day by nixing that sweater, then you want to push me headlong into work. Race, I am just trying to be helpful. You know, Marcus, there are times when you're so helpful, I'd gladly sell you into slavery. Let's go. Max Fain of the Coastal Life Insurance Company raided a beautiful office, secretary to match, and a complete set of tube fingernails. He screwed his face into a pained knot as he watched me light a cigarette. Go ahead, smoke. I have to lay off the things. You should have sent word. I'd have brought along some cubebs. What a business. You know Chuck Hardy? Well, there's a Chuck Hardy who plays third base for the Baltimore Orioles. And there's another one who plays polo and rides her down a $20 million inheritance. Or thereabouts. It's the second one we're talking about. And after the build-up, I have to let you down with a thud. Hardy's lost some jewelry. I think it's of some kind. And because he has a big account with us, he insists that we supply an investigator. Our best. Will you do it, Race? Of course, Max. Never can tell where those things will lead. There's the house across the street, Race. And it looks like you might have a reception for me. Yeah, I noticed that. Mm -hmm. Who's the lad with the bow tie, Mark? He looks familiar. He should. That's Danny Emerald, and he is tough, Race. The genuine article. Now stay put. Yeah. If I need you, I'll give you a nod. Okay. Just don't hold back. Eh? There were three of them, standing at the door to the brownstone front as though waiting to get in. As I went up, I got a look from the one with the bow tie, the one market tabbed as Danny Emerald. I knew the name and the reputation that went with it. The bow tie was wide and soft with an artistic droop, but... Looking into that face, no one was going to comment on it. Where do you think you're going, chum? Oh, I'm here to see a man, and not about a dog. A wise guy, Danny. A lippy character. Sometimes I like wise guys. I may even like this one, if he gets us past this door. Stand back, Trigo. You two feet. When that butler looks through the peephole and just sees this guy... Maybe we'll all go in. I think I'd rather go in by myself. You don't like company, is that it? You want to be antisocial? I just want to go in by myself. Me, I like company. 
I ain't antisocial at all. So I'm going with you. Me and the boys. You don't really want to do a thing like that. It'll be in bad taste. What I tell you, Danny, a wise guy. I don't think the butler's coming anyway. So if you don't mind... Wait a second, wise guy, rushing off like that. Danny might want to talk to you. Biting you, Danny. You have a strong grip. Sure. I know how to use it, too. Take it off my arm. Don't like it, huh? Too rough for you, is it, wise guy? I said take it off my arm. And if I don't, just what are you going to do about it, wise guy? Just this. Oh. Oh. He had it coming, Emerald. You... Hold it, Trigo. No, Danny. I said hold it. You broke my watch. You can get another one. What's your parlay here, chum? Nothing exciting. I simply came here to see a man, as I told you. And you don't scare. Should I? Sometimes it don't hurt. Sometimes it's smart. I can agree with that. What do you do for a living? I'm an investigator. I had a hunch. You already know this guy, Hardy. No, we've never met him. He's a welcher. He owes me dough and he's trying to crawfish out of painter. A guy with his money. You wouldn't want to work for a welcher. I get the feeling you're telling me that, not asking it. Well, would you? Suppose I said yes. Then you're a sucker, both ways. And I think you'll get what I mean. I'd rather have you give it to me straight. All right, I will. And grave. Hardy and me have got a beef. Stay out of it, or you'll get hurt. <laughs> I tried the Hardy Menage about an hour later, got the same result. No response. I headed for home after that, puzzled a little by Danny Emerald's place in the picture, but not particularly intrigued. From where I looked, it seemed pretty much like an uninspiring sort of case. In front of my apartment house, a man got out of a car, moved to intercept me. He was young, blonde. His features had been freshly battered by someone's fists. You don't happen to be Mr. Race, do you? That's right. I'm Tom Enders, secretary to Mr. Hardy. He's out at the Larches, and he'd like to see you there. And where is the Larches? It's his estate up the river, about 20 miles the other side of Yonkers. Uh, you don't need to bring anything. I've got the car ready. Well, I should pick up a couple of toothbrushes, don't you think? We have those, too. We have everything at the Larches, including trouble. Just the same, I took time to pack a bag. Then I sat beside Enders while he nosed a 1949 Cadillac convertible out of the city and northward along the Hudson River. I understand you're coming up to investigate the missing jewelry. That seems to be it. A few hundred bucks worth of medals and Hardy goes crazy. You sound bitter. I sound that way all the time. It's my natural tone. What does Danny Emerald have to do with Hardy? I wouldn't know. Who is Danny Emerald? A lad who's learned to make gambling pay. You're bitter. You've been battered. What's the story? My boss doesn't trust me. Hardy? Mr. Hardy. For a while, he had the idea I might have taken the stuff. You? And because I wouldn't admit it, Mr. Hardy became angry. And when he gets angry, Mr. Hardy likes to maul people. Mr. Hardy is very good at mauling people. He was Olympic light heavyweight contender in 36. Well, what do you do about a situation like that? Me? I just stand there and take it. I got a wife and a couple of kids. I'm 33 years old. During the war, I spent almost four years in the Army, and that takes a chunk out of a man's life. It gets to be that a job's a job. So it seems worth it. Not to me alone, it doesn't. Having the wife and the kids, well, a job's a job. Who else beside Hardy will be at the lodges? Quite a few people, including a woman who will make you forget everything but your name. Larches looked like a B-picture nightclub, and I got the feeling that the rest of the house would match it, both as to size and decoration. Anders and I took a small elevator up to a custom-built gymnasium. It had been finished in leather and chrome and a finely stained wood, but it smelled like all gymnasiums. It affected me as being the first really human thing about the place. As I watched, a vicious blonde pinwheeled across a large mat. And watching it languidly, it was a man with the features of a collar ad and eyes like bad wishes. Anders and I walked across to him. And I met Chuck Hardy, nine gold polo player. I've been wondering when you'd get here. I called at your place in town. You had another visitor at the same time. A lad by the name of 
Danny Emerald? Oh? You seem to have designs on your peace of mind. Emerald and I had a disagreement about a bet. I wired him this morning that he'd get the money from Enders tonight. That doesn't really concern you, does it? I had an idea that the news might be of some interest to you. My only interest lies in getting back the items that were stolen from me. I understand that what you lost doesn't have a great deal of value. It does to me. Small stuff, sometimes hard to recover. Look, Junior, I want those things back. I'd like that understood. I'd like something understood, too. I've suddenly developed a conviction that you and I aren't going to be compatible. Maybe no one's ever mentioned it to you, Hardy, but you're about as agreeable as a wad of gum on a throttle pedal. Get yourself another boy. I'm going back to town. I want to know further part of the Hardy setup. So I found a phone, called the nearest village to check on train reservations. I learned that the next train out wouldn't be leaving for another four hours. I also learned that the village had no taxi service available. I was mulling over the prospect of a six-mile hike when I noticed the girl who had been gyrating in the gym. Where there was another young woman. A tawny-skinned, flame-haired girl who gave me a what-are-you-going-to-do-about-it look that made me breathe deeply to maintain my poise. It was this one who spoke to me. Running away, Mr. Race? Oh, that's quite an opening. Where do we go from there? I'd like to see you stay. Anyone with the nerve to say no to Chuck Hardy is needed around this place. Am I to believe that you can't swim? Not I or any other woman in the world. Not Chuck Hardy. Well, if he doesn't go for you, he's kidding himself that he's alive. Meryl, I knew I was going to like this man. I get the impression you don't care for our host. Then why stick around? Touche. You can be very direct, Mr. Ray. Just matching your mood. You can get along with Chuck once you know him. Meryl here likes polo. That's why she likes Hardy. People who go for polo all adore Hardy. Jerk. <laughs> There's nothing quite so fascinating as a lovely woman who uses earthy language. Particularly when she has red hair. What's your name? Jay Conlon. And in case you don't know, this is Meryl Reed. Hello. Both interesting people. I'm sorry I can't stick around to know you better. Oh, if you're stuck for transportation, take my car. Uh, just leave it at Nagel's garage for me. Be still, Meryl. I don't want him to go back. Oh, sorry, lovely, but this place curdles my ego. All right, Meryl, I'll take you up on the loan of that car. Thanks. It's a green town and country. Here are the keys. There was no one around as I went to the garage, found Meryl Reed's car, climbed in. I stuck the key in the ignition lock, was about to stab the starter when a glance at a rearview mirror froze all my actions. There was someone in the seat behind me, a man, sitting grim, silent. I turned very slowly, and in the light of the dashboard panel, I saw that it was Enders. He seemed to be smiling until I realized that the expression was really a distorted grimace. Enders was dead. Something or someone had broken his neck. We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. Back to the adventures of Frank Race. Crime is a funny thing. You get into a part of it that starts out in a small way, and suddenly you find yourself in the middle of something big and ugly. I crawled into the back seat of the Chrysler. In addition to his neck, Ender's right arm had been broken, along with one of the fingers of his right hand. At his feet, I noticed one of those new pencil cigarette lighter combinations. I stuck this in my pocket and went back to the house. I found Hardy in his study with him, a middle-aged woman with a sweet face and a quiet smile. But Hardy made no effort to introduce us. I thought you were getting lost. I was on the way. But I thought I'd better tell you that your secretary is dead. Enders? Dead? <laughs> what is this, a gag? Are you sitting in the back of that green crest in your garage? Sounds like a job for you, Martha. Or the coroner. 
Mr. Race, I'd better introduce myself, since Charles never bothers with trivialities. I'm Dr. Clemson, the Hardy family physician. Well, I'm sure you can't do anything for Andrews, Doctor. But you might take a look. I'll come right away. <laughs> I stuck around another hour till the local peace officer became satisfied I could tell him no more than I already had. Then I talked one of Hardy's chauffeurs into taking me to town. I got to the station with 15 minutes to wait for the outgoing train. It wasn't what you'd call a busy station, but I soon had company. Hiya, chum. Hello, Emerald. What are you doing here? I got some dough coming. 50 grand. Guy would go anywhere for 50 grand. I'll do anything. That sounds rather pointed. It is. You see, I just been talking to Chuck Hardy. He was telling me about Enders. Yeah, that was rough. Funny rough, but understandable. I don't get you. Enders had that 50 grand on him for me. How do you know him? Hardy just told me. We had quite a phone conversation, me and Hardy. What else did he tell you? He told me that so far as he knows... The only other guy that knew about that 50 grand was you. So? So, you could save yourself a lot of grief by ponying up right now. What makes you so sure that Hardy was leveling with you? Hardy don't lie. He's a heel and he's stubborn, but he don't lie. You don't have to. Not when it comes to dough. So I go down in your diary as a wrong guy. Not yet you don't. I don't mind a guy trying to turn a buck. I just don't want to be the loser on the deal. Well, I don't have that kind of money on me. I'll let you look if you like. Mm. Suppose I give you an hour. An hour to make up your mind. An hour to show up with it. Out at Hardy's place. You're a very reasonable man. So my friends tell me. And I got lots of friends. I got three of them in this neighborhood right now. Including Trigo. I get it. So, you meet me at Hardy's place in an hour. Play it smart, Brace. Be there with the dough. I went to the local drugstore called New York City. I was lucky enough to get Mark Donovan right away. Hey, what are you doing, Race? Having yourself a time? You're having a wonderful time. Wish you were here. Huh? What's wrong? How soon do you think you could get here? A place called the Larches, six miles west of Glenview. Well, uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, oh, maybe like 45 minutes. Well, that'll do. And Mark? Yeah? Bring along that end wrench of yours. <laughs> Back at the Hardy place, I encountered only a couple of servants who eyed me vaguely. I wandered about for a few minutes and finally blundered onto a rather spectacular mezzanine that overlooked the gigantic dining room. It was as I stood here that Meryl Reed appeared. You mind if I say I'm surprised? At seeing me back? You were so definite about your intentions to leave. The forces beyond my control have entered the picture. It's a big room, isn't it? It is. I don't have to stretch my imagination to see Hardy sitting at the head of that table, throwing bones to his boar hounds. But never mind, Hardy. I'd rather concentrate on you. Oh? Look quite fetching in that evening gown. Thanks. But Jade got the same reaction in just a sweater and shorts, didn't she? Nobody's going to overlook you, baby. You're a huskier girl. But it's packed in all the right places. As a matter of fact... Don't try to kiss me, Ray. Not unless you really mean it. How can I know what I mean until I've tried it? Here. No! I had my arms around her, but she twisted sharply away and left me standing there, feeling as a male usually feels under such circumstances, deaf, little and incredulous. I waited a few minutes and then moved out into a large hall where I ran into Dr. Clemson. Yeah. You look like a man with a purpose. I'd like to find Hardy. May I ask what for? Well, you're a family friend. I'm afraid you might not be in sympathy with my plans. I like you, Race. I've known you scarcely long enough to say hello, but I like you. So I'm going to give you a warning. Don't cross Charles Hardy. He's headstrong, he's arrogant. And he has the power to be more vicious than sin. Thanks for the tip. Do you know if the police are still here? No, no, they left. About half an hour ago. 
and took that boy's body with him. How do they figure this business? Well, they're inclined to believe it was an accident. They think Enders might have fallen going down those concrete steps inside the garage. And then planted himself in that car? Well, he could have crawled to the car, Rays. It's possible. Yes. Yes, I suppose it is possible. I was beginning to think that anything could be possible around this spot. Leaving Dr. Clemson, I went out into a night as cool as a preoccupied woman. Then, about a hundred feet from the house, a grim-looking figure suddenly loomed up in front of me. Where are you going, Race? Trigo. Yeah, Trigo. What do you want? Three guesses. Stay where you are, Race. I got you and the moon just right. So I'm properly lighted. Now what? Danny gave you an hour, didn't he? Just one hour. I've been keeping track. I still have eight minutes. Eight minutes. That ain't a very long time, is it, Race? Not when a guy like me is waiting for the payoff. I still don't have the money, Trigo. That's going to make Danny kind of sad. But it ain't going to bother me at all. And you know why? I can imagine. You like your pound of flesh, Trigo. And after all, I did break your watch. Yeah, you broke my watch. And I couldn't get it fixed. Know how I got that watch race? No comment. I won it in a contest, singing on a stage, and you had to go break it. I'm sorry about the watch, Trigo. You're being sorry don't make no difference. I felt reasonably sure of that. But I thought I'd make the gesture. Incidentally, you're obstructing progress. I was on my way to get that money, but I can't get it standing here, can I? You're lying. I might be, but you can't afford to gamble on it, can you? Danny Emerald isn't interested in watches. He wants that 50 grand. You're stolen. I'm going to plan up slugging you. But not for several more minutes. If you fire before the time's up, Danny might not like it. I just thought of that, so I really don't need to stick around here, do I? Hey! I paid no attention to his yell. Just kept legging it to the house, away from that gun in his hand. But I could hear him coming right behind me. Then, from up behind... Right! Over here! Marcus. Marcus, boy, to say the least, I'm very happy to see you. <laughs> That guy ain't so tough. He didn't like that slug I sent him. Look, what, what, what goes on here? Man? I'm in trouble. Plenty of it. Danny Emerald thinks I'm holding out $50,000 that belongs to him. Oh, Daddy. That ain't good. Not when the guy is Emerald. Everybody says it was Emerald who rubbed out Augie Calder. Emerald's bad. Well, there's no use trying to run away from him. Let's go into the house. Look, ain't you got an out of any kind? Not a thing. I've been wrestling with it every... Wait a minute. There comes a faint flicker of understanding. Yeah? Wrestling. Yes. Come on, Mark. I want you to do something for me. Come on in, Race. We've been kind of waiting for you. It looked like the gathering of a clan. There was Hardy and his three feminine guests. And Emerald had with him two of the friends he had mentioned. I told myself I could probably expect Trigo at any second. Grace, we thought we heard a shot a moment ago. Well, nothing important, Dr. Clemson. It missed. Emerald, I may as well give it to you straight. I don't have that money. I've never had it. What are you trying to prove, Race? That you don't scare? You can run that kind of thing into the ground. Race, why didn't you leave? Now you're in trouble. He ain't that kind, honey. Are you, Race? Here, Merrill. Have a smoke and calm down. Mm -hmm. yeah, try this lighter, Merrill. And you may as well keep it. I believe it's yours anyway. Gosh, yes. Where'd you find it? Alongside Ender's body. What are you talking about? Merrill's a rare girl. She knows judo, or jujitsu, if you like that term better. And that's what she used on Ender's as he came down into the garage. A wrist lock, wasn't it, Merrill? A wrist lock often breaks a man's arm, doesn't it? And his neck, too, if he crashes against concrete steps. And I suppose you think you're going to the police with that story? I've already called them. And I think if we hold Miss Reed here, they won't have any trouble finding that 50 grand. I don't care about the money, but I'm not sitting still for the kind of publicity that'll come from this. Merrill. Merrill isn't going anywhere. Is she, Mark? Not while I'm standing here holding this pistol. Now, listen, there's no reason we can't make a deal. I hmm? don't know what you can arrange with the others, Hardy, but I'm not going to agree to a cover-up for murder. What do you want me to do, ram your teeth down your throat? I've been hoping all along you might take that attitude. All right, you've been asking for it. Try this for size! <laughs> Well, not bad. A little high. Yeah? I felt it, though. And you're going to feel this one. Sorry. <laughs> my turn. Oh! Yeah, I felt that one, too. Right up to my wrist. Why don't you get up, Hardy? Then we can both try it again. I'm getting up. Just wait. No! Oh. oh, poor Mr. 
Mr. Hardy. Let's all stay put now, till the police get here. And that goes for you too, Emerald. I ain't making a single move. Race, will you teach me to handle myself like that? Think of the interesting things I could do to all the mauling males I meet. I don't know, Sugar. I've got plans for you, but they don't include boxing lessons. <laughs> Adventures of Frank Ray, starring Tom Collins with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Wilms Herbert, Paul Dubov, and Gerald Moore. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this same time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production.